go. Awesome. Hey everyone. So my name is Laura Wanowski. I am a third year biochemistry major. Um, and today I'm presenting on Mary Ann Warren's 1973 paper uh, on the moral and legal status of abortion. Uh, this is a topic I'm really passionate about. Um, it's been in the news a lot lately, especially with the March for Life last weekend um, in DC, like the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. So I really enjoyed the opportunity to go in depth um, to both sides of this argument and analyze Warren's thoughts. Uh, so an outline for my presentation is going to be just a summary of her argument, <coughs> go into the major points, um, talk about her post commentary on infanticide, do an analysis of her argument, and then I'll pose the discussion questions. So Warren's thesis, um, first and foremost, is that a fetus is not a person in the moral sense. She kind of excludes the genetic sense, um, but in the, in the moral sense. And so therefore, she says that it does not have the entity um, to ascribe full moral rights, including the right to life. Uh, that's her right off the bat, her, her thesis, and later in the paper she kind of establishes that even if it were a person and were able to um, be fully ascribed those full moral rights, uh, the mother's right to her body, her health, her happiness, etc., would ultimately trump, uh, no matter the circumstances. So because of that, she concludes um, and then goes on to present that abortion is moral and abortion should be legal, um, and that because of the arguments that she's going to propose, uh, there are some other moral issues that definitely should be reconsidered, like euthanasia, terminally ill patients, assisted suicide, that kind of thing. So she begins um, by talking about Judith Thompson's violinist analogy. We kind of covered that with Pence, that you've been kidnapped, you wake up connected to this famous violinist, and he has to use your kidneys for the next nine months. It's the only way he can survive. So she calls this a clever but faulty analogy. And she says that it's applicable in the cases of rape because of the kidnapping, um, but it's difficult to apply to abortion as a whole because what happens when the mother has voluntarily in, been involved in sexual activity knowing conception is a probability. Um, so this is not really in, uh, <coughs> this is not in the paper, but um, I think I'm saying this right, the Guttmacher, I don't know if you know this. Guttmacher, okay, that makes better sense. Uh, they did a study, and they released it in 2005. It was kind of difficult to find more um, up-to-date studies, but basically they were interested in who's getting abortions, where are they getting them done, how are they getting them done, and why are they getting them done. And so they compared uh, 1987 and 2004 data, and for the primary reason as to why the women were getting an abortion, you can see that in 1987, it was 1% due to rape and less than 0.5% due to rape in 2004. So Warren, logically and understandably, and therefore we will, proceed with the argument is that rape is not the main issue of abortion we're talking about. We're talking about the broader issue of abortion, um, since the majority of abortions are not really related to rape. So she goes on to say, uh, what if you modify the analogy and you... Um, have now joined this violin society that is going to voluntarily you, either randomly be drawn or you are deliberately going to sign up to save the violinist, what would happen then? And that really takes us back to square one because it's the, the same question. Does the fetus have full rights? And Warren makes a side note that in her opinion, similar to when a person creates a work of art, they're able to destroy that art on their own. She thinks that it gives the mother more right to um, terminate the pregnancy if she has consciously um, created the, the fetus. But that takes us back to square one, and so she concludes that Thompson's analogy cannot really help us determine whether or not abortion is morally permissible. So she goes on to present the typical uh, abortion argument, and she does this in an if p then q format. And she establishes that it is wrong to kill innocent human beings. She takes that as self-evident. We don't need to further discuss that. We all pretty much agree innocent human beings have a right to life. Uh, but the question is, fetuses are innocent human beings. So the P is, if fetuses are innocent human beings, then Q, it is wrong to kill those fetuses. And so the argument is, is too true in the moral sense? She distinguishes between the uh, genetic sense of humanity and the moral sense. Genetic sense referring to uh, clearly a fetus has uh, hum homo sapien DNA. It was conceived by two homo sapiens. It's in growing inside of a homo sapien. 
Um, but then the moral sense, this is where she establishes those five criteria that we just had the quiz on. And she says that this is in comparison to a normal, healthy adult that she's making these about. Um, and she says that they are pretty much self-evident and that even the pro-life activists could agree that these are the five criteria for humanity. Uh, number one, consciousness, particularly the capacity to feel pain. Number two, reasoning, a developed capacity. Number three, capable of independently self-motivated activity, meaning there's not an external or genetic force acting, creating or causing the activity. Uh, number four, the capacity to communicate indefinitely. She means indefinite in the sense that an indefinite number of topics, an indefinite number of issues, and arguably an indefinite number of ways to communicate. And number five, the presence of self-concepts and self-awareness. Just the process of self-actualization self -actualization that the being is able to form thoughts about itself. So she then kind of goes into this analogy of what if we have a space explorer that has gone to a new planet and meets these aliens, and she makes the statement that one and two, uh, consciousness and reasoning, may be sufficient for personhood, and depending on how you define activity, may, may be only one through three. She does admit that posing these five percent <coughs> definitions will create further issues, and she understands that it's a hard thing to do, but she poses them nonetheless and then makes the statement that even though it's hard to say which of these five have to come together to say it is a person, if it doesn't satisfy any of them, one through five, it's definitely not a person in the moral sense. So establishing this, she says that she's speaking her, uh, specifically to John Noonan. He kind of defends the Catholic Church position. Um, and he touches on the genetic sense of humanity. And she says, well, okay, just because it has, you know, human DNA, we can't consider that. Let's ignore that. Let's focus only on the moral per humanity. And with that being established, that means that patients in a vegetative state are human beings, but they are no longer humans or persons. Uh, humans in the moral sense or persons. She kind of equates moral humanity and personhood. She then also says that depending upon when... Um, Defective, de defective wasn't really clear, and I kind of looked for clarification on that, but just a mentally handicapped person. Um, depending on when that handicap incident occurs, they are also homo sapiens, human beings, but no longer persons. And along this argument, fetuses, therefore, are human beings, but not yet persons. And she says, mind you, she wrote this in 1973, so here we are a couple generations into the future, I mean, over in the Georgia Tech Labs, we have robots that you can interact with and communicate with. And she says that future generations may acknowledge self-aware um, self robots and computers as, as persons. So this uh, argument then kind of poses two main questions. She foresees two oppositions to her argument. Following conception, how much time must pass before the fetus does attain <coughs> those moral rights um, because of its likeness of a human? And she cites this, uh, this guy, Thomas Hayes, and I looked for more like, information on him, and it was kind of hard to find. But what I did find was that it's a 1967 paper entitled Abortion. Uh, I don't know if it was well received, but it wasn't really well talked about. But he just basically says that as the fetus develops and grows more, uh, develops more biological attributes, then in his opinion, that's how moral right should also develop on a, on a linear scale, per se. Um, but... Uh, Warren doesn't really like this idea, and she says that one through five, her criteria still trump. And so, in this regard, uh, where am I? Okay, in this regard, uh, she talks about a fetus, and she says, "Well, yes, it can feel pain. It does satisfy number one." Again, the research on this is kind of unclear. I know in our last section on in vitro fertilization, not in vitro fertilization, on um, embryonic stem cell research. Pence kind of establishes, and the government has kind of established, that after 14 days, embryos can feel pain. There's some discrepancy in the research as to whether that's like 20 weeks or that two weeks, but for our purposes, we'll just stick with the two weeks. Or uh, Yeah, it can feel pain. The fetus can feel pain. And she acknowledges that, yes, the fetus does have brain activity. Certainly, after that 14 days, it has neurons, and the development from there on out is, is active. Uh, but she says it is not fully conscious, it's unable to communicate, it can't have self-motivated activity, um, it's not self-aware, so it doesn't satisfy three through five. Um, so she says, again, no. And she says that even a fully developed fetus is not person-like enough to have any significant right to life on the basis of its person-likeness. 
She says that it is no more person, even a fully developed fetus um, at the age of nine months, is no more person than a mature fish. And she says that a human fetus at that stage is more comparable to a guppy. This is a guppy. <laughs> uh, so then the next um, opposition that she foresees is potentiality. And it's the argument of, well, should the potential for a fetus to become a person be considered? Certainly, if you leave it alone, it will become a person, uh, whether it's handicapped or not. It's a different story. But what, what does that matter in this, in this argument? And she acknowledges that it's very much a prima facie. Did I say that right? Prima facie? Yeah, um, that at, at the surface level, basically, when you first take this argument, that certainly, yes, because it can develop to become a person and has that potential, that should be enough of an argument for its right to life. But in that case, she loops back around and says the mother's rights always trump those of the fetus. So, so con conclusively, she says abortion is not killing a person because the fetus is not a person. If it were a person, the mother's right would still trump and that abortion is moral and should be legal. So in 19, 1982, excuse me, nine years after the paper came out, she had had a lot of um, attacks, basically, on her paper because, because of this, um, in her five criteria, a, a very glaring, obvious statement is that infanticide is legal um, and moral, in, according to her argument, based on her five criteria because a newborn infant has none of those, um, meets none of those criteria, just like a nine-month fetus does not also meet those criteria. So she, post, um, she republished her paper with a commentary on infanticide, and she says that there has long been a cultural and historical opposition to killing newborn babies. Obviously, we all agree that would be wrong. Um, and she p says there are many reasons why, but she gives us two, and she says that the case for adoption is certainly one of those, that once the um, fetus has been brought into the world and is a baby, um, it can be given up for adoption, and she takes the utilitarian view that the couple who would adopt the baby's happiness can outweigh the mother's unhappiness about the situation. And she makes the argument, okay, well, what about a late-term fetus? Um, she, again, is foreseeing oppositions, and she says, why is a nine-month fully developed fetus, why is that still okay to abort it? And she says that the mother's right uh, surpasses that of the <coughs> fetus. And she claims that um, when a newborn baby is born, it is not that it develops the right to life in that moment, that it suddenly is, okay, we can say it's alive, but that it's the mother's right to control it that end. She makes that distinction that it's not the baby's right, it's just that the mother, it's not the baby's right growing, it's the mother's right ending. Um, and she then kind of makes the case about terminally ill neonates. Neonates are simply just um, defined medically as any infant under the age of four weeks, and she says, so in that case, yeah, she thinks it might be okay to commit um, infanticide because the baby might not live, and it would be a lot more difficult on people to continue to watch that baby develop, even though it's terminally ill. So there are a lot of oppositions um, to Mary Ann Warren's paper, um, and I cover a couple of them, and the first one is on the term self-evident. So a big criticism of Mary Ann Warren's paper is that she uses the term self-evident. I counted in total, she uses it six times. Um, but these are two um, arguments that have kind of been proposed about like philosophical thought. You can't really use the term self-evident because according to Quentin Smith, he was this atheist philosopher. And in his 1994 book, he was, um, he was talking, he wasn't talking about abortion. He was talking about something related to secularism and, and um, religion, but he says, a principle is self-evident if and only if everybody who understands believes. Certainly people are still opposed to Mary Ann Warren's paper, which is why we're still fighting about it. Um, so some of the modern day critics say, well, should we just throw the whole thing out? Because she makes these terms self-evident. We're not going to do that. Uh, but then there's the second statement. This is called Hitchens Razor. Um, it's attributed to this man, Christopher Hitchens, who is another atheist philosopher. But apparently it goes further back than that, and it reaches back to Latin, which I'm not going to say it, but basically that which is asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. And so the main issue here is that where Warren makes her five criteria for um, moral humanity and personhood, people are saying, well, where does she come up with these? She just basically says, if the pro-life activists cannot agree that these five things are the moral criteria, for personhood, well then we can't even argue with them because they're on a different page than we are. She doesn't really go into that. So that's the first critique. 
The second one is um, f further along with her arbitrary definitions. Albert Camus is a French writer, um, I guess you could call him a philosopher, I don't really know if he had like a set philosophy, but he makes a, in a, we're talking about the secular case, but he makes the religious argument that says he would rather live as if there was a God and die and find out there wasn't, than live as if there wasn't a God to die and find out if there were. And so the secular kind of take on that is that when we're looking at abortion, we have four possible um, cases. A fetus is a person, and we know it with 100% certainty. A fetus is a person, and we don't know it with 100% certainty. A fetus is not a person, and we know it with 100% certainty. And a fetus is not a person, and we don't know it with 100% certainty. Basically, because we're still arguing over abortion, we don't know which one of these is the case, and so you can remove one and three from the ethical argument, which leaves you with two and four, which brings up the analogy of shooting in a dark room. And the analogy is, is that you would not go into a dark room with a gun if you don't know whether or not there are people in there. You wouldn't shoot because you might kill someone, you might not, you don't know, so you err on the side of caution and you don't shoot. That's the argument that is getting at and being presented here. The next critique is um, by a man named Stephen Schwartz, and he's a philosopher who wrote a book called uh, The Moral Question of Abortion in 1990. And he says that Marianne Warren is confusing being a human being with functioning as a human being. And he says the two are not mutually exclusive. And he gives the example of um, a person sleeping. And I'll give you a minute if you want to read through this quote. So from this, he's basically getting at the point that just because a being is not functioning as a human being does not mean that it is not human. Because when we all go to sleep, um, if you're under large amounts of alcohol, if you are in anesthesia or other under, under the use of anesthesia, in surgery or some other drug, certainly you are not functioning as a human being. And so he says her five criteria do not count in those regards. And then he argues that... So if just because not functioning like a human being um, means you are not a human, he makes the flip side and says that just because you do function as a human being does not mean you are a human being. And that would be the example um, which she kind of touches at in her post-commentary on infanticide that chimpanzees, um, other apes, and dolphins, they kind of have those same attributes as humans. Um, and they're, but they're not humans, and we don't have, they're not human beings in the moral sense, and we don't have a problem agreeing on that. So he also gives this analogy of a reversible coma. And he says that imagine two children are born. The first is born comatose, but he will awaken in nine years. Somehow you miraculously know he will awaken nine years from the day. And the second child is born healthy only long enough to um, reach Warren's five criteria uh, for a moral personhood. But then she enters a coma from which she will wake up miraculously in nine years. And according to Warren's argument, killing the first child is morally permissible because he has not yet reached or met those five criteria, whereas it would be immoral to kill the second child because she has already met those five criteria. So this leads into a discussion on potentiality. Uh, Warren does not really defend the issue of potentiality very well. She does not address, well, what would happen? She just says, okay, well, even if it is a person, well, then no, the mother's right still Trump. She doesn't really define why that is or go into detail and explanation as to why. She just says that's how it is. Um, but there are some philosophers and pro-life activists who break this down into active potential and passive potential. Active potential is the ability an object, the, the capability of an object to become something on its own from an inward growth. An example of this is like a seed or a plant. If you plant it and you let it grow, it will become a tree, a bush, a flower, whatever it is, on its own. Versus passive potential, which are like comparison, um, ingredients for a cake, parts of a car, where they actually require something else to put them together to become the being in question. And certainly a fetus has active potential, uh, whereas it 
it would not have passive potential. It's not like something else is coming together to put all of its parts together. It develops from within. And a opposition to this argument is, well, what about brain-dead patients? And so um, Schwartz is the guy who addresses this, and he says that brain-dead patients are declared dead because they have lost the active potential, whereas um, fetuses still have the active potential. Brain-dead patients have lost the active potential, and depending on the circumstances and what machines are available, um, they may retain that passive potential to keep their heart beating or breathing. So fetuses retain that active potential, Therefore, they should be left alone, let to develop like we do with plants. We kind of protect invasive species, or not invasive species, endangered species. And so people say, well, why shouldn't we protect um, the fetuses? And then there's this guy, Christopher Kazor. I think I'm saying his last name right. Uh, in 2011, he wrote a really in-depth book called The Ethics of Abortion. And if anyone is interested in further going through this argument, um, he goes into a lot of detail. He analyzes all of the pro-life arguments, all of the pro-choice arguments, and then comes to his own conclusions. Um, but he says that we kind of agree as a society that if there's an inmate on death row, you would not kill it, kill him or her um, a week early, three days early, a day early, because we have all agreed that it has that it. He or she has the right um, to those last couple of days, even if nothing's going to happen, even if there's no lawyer fighting for his case or an appeal, um, we kind of agree as a society that it's morally wrong to kill him or her early, and so this is a similar argument. So then on the issue of infanticide, um, like I said, she published her paper originally in 1973, but in 1982 she republished it after severe criticism um, with this postscript addressing infanticide. And she says, again, that her two arguments, even though there are many, she only gives us two, um, that it's because we have a moral and, or a cultural and historical opposition to killing newborn babies, and two, because those babies could be given up for adoption. She describes some issues with adoption, and then, she, like I mentioned earlier, she certainly says that even the nine-month fetus, um, if it's the day before it's to be born, the mother's right still trumps. Well, the issue that she kind of points out is that uh, she fails to acknowledge open versus closed adoption. I don't know if this was different when she was publishing um, her paper, but nowadays the mother can choose whether or not she wants to have an open or closed adoption. An open adoption is where uh, she's allowed to be involved in the child's life, she's allowed to have like visits, she gets you know updates, whereas a closed adoption is there's no further communication unless the child later on in life seeks that out. And that's all handled legally, so I don't know if Warren was aware of that, but that is um, available. But it seems that she is inconsistent. A lot of people criticized her post-commentary as um, like a scramble and that she was just trying to support her argument when it really doesn't seem to make sense. If you even look at um, back when she's talking about the aliens and what if you go to space and you have these aliens there, she says that maybe only one in two are necessary for personhood, where later in the paper she admits that, okay, a fetus can feel pain and certainly it has brain activity, satisfying one in two, but she doesn't go on to say, well, what happens then? Uh, so she seems to contradict herself, and her infanticide argument seems inconsistent to some people, and they compare her to Peter Singer. Certainly Peter Singer and Mary Ann Warren have shared ideas. He is still living. He is a professor at um, Princeton, and she has recently, I don't know recently, but she's since passed away. Um, but our textbook author is a major um, supporter of Peter Singer, and he's kind of been in the news the past couple of years because people are calling for him to resign from Princeton. It's probably not going to happen. But in his website and in a lot of arguments, uh, excuse me, interviews, he supports infanticide. Um, I'm not going to read through this. You can go on to his website. It's right there, princeton.edu, psinger.faq. Um, but he supports infanticide. He says it's not... It's not the best thing to do. Certainly it's still terrible because we don't want parents to have brought a child into the world and then to kill it. But at least he openly says, yes, it's still okay. Whereas criticism or critiques of Warren's paper say that she doesn't really admit that that's what her argument um, is suggesting. And it's okay if it is, but she just should support it rather than scrambling to find an argument that, um, that goes against it. So you just kind of read through this, he talks about when he thinks it's okay and that primarily it's when um, the baby is not healthy and what about a normal baby, he goes into that and then further on um, euthanasia and the elderly and stuff like that. But, so in conclusion, 
the, uh, the strengths of Warren's argument is that she does give a thorough analysis of previous pro-choice arguments. Um, she does an in-depth analysis of Judith Thompson's famous violinist argument and basically makes her case valid as to why, she, why this argument does not work and why her argument is going to be better. Um, she seeks to ensure that the argument is logical and valid. You can leave it up to yourself whether or not she has done that sufficiently. Um, but with her P then Q, if the fetus is an innocent human being, it would be wrong to kill it. She makes the separation of genetic and moral sense of humanity, which is certainly important. Um, another strength is that she seeks to formulate precise criteria for personhood. Again, you can decide whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. She admits that it's a tricky issue, but she at least seeks to formulate those five solid criteria, whether or not she follows through with them. She describes the rationale and importance behind each idea. Every time she poses a foreseeable opposition, she explains why it's necessary to address that, why the right questions have to be asked, specifically when she's Looking at Noonan's argument, she discusses why it's important to um, ask the right kinds of questions. And she seeks to acknowledge the pro-life oppositions about the right to life. So well, some weaknesses of her argument are that she fails to acknowledge the major proponent of the pro-life stance, which is insolment. And this kind of gets back into religious versus secular debate. But she seems to think that the biggest pro-life issue is the right to life, whereas a lot of pro-life activists, it's more of insolment in that the embryo or the fetus has a soul and it would be wrong to take its soul, and personhood is based on the soul, which is why even though if those five criteria stand, uh, dolphins or chimpanzees are still not human beings in the moral sense because they do not have a soul like you or I do. Uh, her criteria one through five, is it contradictory? She makes the statement that if a being does not have any of those five and has none of one through five criteria, then it's certainly not a person. But she later relents and says that yes, fetuses do have one and two, they meet that criteria, but she never really establishes what happens then. She just relents back to, well, in that case, the mother's right to trump, mother's right to life trumps. Um, Potentiality discussion does not follow P then Q format. Same thing is that when she says if the fetus is a moral human being, um, th that's not really a P then Q argument. It's more of a if the fetus is a moral human being, then R, that this kind of trumps. Um, but it doesn't stay in line with her original, original moral one. Uh, definition of self-evidence. Is it a lack of defensive position? Should those things just be self-evident? The issue of infanticide in a weak postscript. And then lastly, she fails to defend how a mother's right supersedes that of a fetus when her life isn't threatened, nine-month-old fetus, um, where she says, again, that the right of the fetus to live still does not exist, but that it's the mother's right ending to terminate that pregnancy. So leading into this, a couple of discussion questions. Um, are Warren's criteria for personhood, at least in the moral sense, we'll continue to ignore the genetic sense, are they sound and applicable? Do they include or exclude comatose patients, individuals under the influence of anesthesia, or people sleeping? Why or why not? Certainly when you look at those, and according to Stephen Schwartz, that's you and me every night we go to bed. We do not function as human beings. Are we still considered moral persons? Is that relevant? Are those um, sound and applicable criteria? Is that how you would judge um, moral personhood? Two, if a fetus is a person and has a right to life, should the mother's moral and legal rights surmount the moral and legal rights of the fetus? If it's unclear if the fetus is a person, person excuse me, should the same argument apply? Um, which is basically the, the case of abortion. So even if you set aside all of Mary, Mary Ann Warren's other arguments, you're still left with this argument, which is why people have kind of critiqued her paper as maybe it's not as sufficient and thorough as she would have liked. And three, does Warren's commentary on infanticide validate her argument or weaken it. In light of her criteria for personhood, is her argument against infanticide sound? So does that follow naturally? Um, does that make her argument stronger because she recognizes that as a weakness and comments on it? Or should she be like Peter Singer and just come out and say, yes, this is, this is a lot logical um, following from my thoughts and I am for it. So, there you go. All right, thanks. Other questions for Yolanda? Yeah, all right, good, thanks. All right, so there's a lot we